I think before we can talk about the cycling of the sun, we have to understand magnetism, or at least be able to visualize magnetism and have some sense of what the heck a magnet is and how, what it's doing. Um, a huge, uh, so, so we'll get to that first thing. But I want to at least give you guys an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, we'll do magnetism, we'll do space weather, that includes the, the solar cycles essentially. And then the back half of this, I want to like really dig into the history of what led us to the, the pres present understanding of the material nature of the sun. Because, um, you know, and I, and I really want to impress upon you why it matters so much, right? You might think, you know, why is this guy going on about the material nature of the sun? And I am going to spend a lot of time in it. If I don't finish it today, we'll spend more time next, next week because I think that it's one of the most pivotal pieces uh, of information regarding the entirety of astrophysics and cosmology, right? So, you know, we have this, we've inherited this concept through a great deal of debate during the 19th and 20th centuries about whether the sun, what, what, what was, was it a solid, was it a liquid, was it a gas? Um, and it's kind of ironic because the reason that we ended up deciding that it was something more like a gas had to do with the invention of the concept of fusion. Uh, now, we're at an interesting point in our society today um, where we really, really want this fusion energy, right? People are very intuitively concerned about clean energy, right? They just want to stop burning stuff, right? I certainly would love to see less burning of stuff. Um, you know, where I live, it's, people are burning wood just to stay warm for the most part. It's, uh, it can be kind of rough in the wintertime. And then, of course, you know, you got summer, uh, you got the fires in the summer, but a lot of the world is like that. Um, and then, of course, we have combustion engines, which we try to clean up as much as possible. But a lot of the world still depends on coal, and, and most transportation depends on petroleum burning. So I think new sources of clean energy are, are really desirable in this moment. And fusion is such a promising solution, right? Because we obviously have traditional nuclear power, and I think we'll touch on a bit how that works uh, in the next week. But Traditional nuclear power is scary to people, right? When they think of nuclear, they think of bombs, right? Or they think of radioactive waste. And, you know, some of that hysteria is a bit misfounded because, of course, nuclear uh, disasters have killed far less people than combustion engines um, by a long shot. But it's not attractive in the same way as fusion because fusion promises very little waste, like if any radioactive waste. Um, we can get the basic substrate, the fuel, straight out of the oceans, essentially. All you need is hydrogen, which you can get from water, um, and some, some other uh, heavier versions of that also you can get from water. So fusion's really, really desirable. Now, every couple of years you see a headline that's like, we're five seconds away from having fusion power. I don't know if you guys have, have you guys seen these headlines kind of across your lifetime? Like, any day now we'll have fusion power, right? Um, the problem is, a lot of those headlines are, are more hopeful than realistic. So, you know, they'll say something like, well, we've had a, I know there was a huge headline last year in December uh, that came out of the Ignition Laboratory at Lawrence Berkeley, and it was something like, we've achieved net positive gains from these fusion experiments, right? Which sounds freaking awesome. But you start to look into it, and what do they mean by that, really? Well, they mean that the energy contained in this laser pulse, which, ex which is supposed to smash this gas, these gases, excite them into these great frenetic states so that they collide and actually the atoms fuse and join. The energy of that laser pulse, the actual photons themselves, was slightly less than the output of the fusion reactions that, that were developed. However, the power necessary for that laser was something like 400 times the amount of power that they actually got out of that reaction. So that's a long ways off from actually being able to have something that's self-sustaining, right? You need to at least be able to power the plant itself, or let's say the laser that's generating it. And so while I think that there's a genuine optimism about we can do this, right? It is definitely a natural phenomenon that happens. Fusion certainly happens. It's almost inconceivable to think of 
where we get new elements, all of this heavy stuff, you know, uh, carbons and oxygen, iron, those things have to come from smaller building blocks, and stars are the perfect place to have that happen. But the approach that we're taking to it, well, at least the most popular approach, is essentially following the breadcrumbs from this earlier idea that the sun being a gaseous, they now call it, well, it's now being called a plasma, but essentially a gaseous plasma, the best hope for us performing these fusion reactions on Earth is to contain a gas inside of some sort of magnetic boundary, right? We'll, we'll squeeze it in place with a magnet and we'll smash it with light because that's the basic tw early 20th century conception of how the stars power themselves. Now, if it turns out that there is a revolution in astronomy and people start thinking about the sun as being something more of a structured lattice, still hydrogen, right? Still the same building blocks but they start thinking about it in terms of a different material architecture, then we might have a very different approach to how to pursue fusion that might actually be more promising. And there's actually a couple of groups at NASA right now that are working on a different kind of fusion method. Um, they're very quiet about this. I've tried very hard to get some of these people on my podcast. There's one group out in Cleveland that's working on it at the Glenn Research Institute. And I've talked with these people a bunch, and there's two papers you can read about. It's called Lattice Confined Fusion. It's actually a kind of fusion that's done ambiently at room temperature, so it doesn't require these huge magnets and you know, 10,000 Kelvin gas, uh, apparat uh, gas chambers and so forth, right? What they do is they essentially sandwich some of the substrate, those, those basic heavy hydrogens that they're trying to squish together. They sandwich them between layers of, of something solid. Um, and they actually apply the laser pulse, much, much weaker laser pulse, to the top of that lattice. And the lattice works with the, the energy of the pulse to squish those atoms together between the layers and actually fuses them. So completely different approach, which has a very different understanding uh, of how, of the circumstances under which fusion might occur. Um, so anyways, I think that this matters on a technological level. It also matters on an astrophysical level and more towards the cosmological side. So the goal of this course, eventually at the end of it, is to come up with some sense of the universe as a whole, right? And, and how the different parts work and how we on Earth relate to that. That's essentially what cosmology is. Now, the, the popular cosmology of the late 20th century, well, really, let's just say the 20th century is this idea called the Big Bang Theory, which you all have almost certainly heard of, right? It's an enormously popular idea, which was actually fashioned by a Jesuit priest in the 1920s, right? Very popular with the Pope, of course, because it, in some sense, echoes the creation story of the Bible. Now, there's really only two pillars that are, you know, in any way compelling about the Big Bang Theory. One of them concerns the redshift of light, and we'll deal with that when we talk about spectroscopy in subsequent weeks. The other one is this thing called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, this is, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to go into this in detail later, but needless to say, the cosmic microwave background radiation is also a perfect black body spectrum, just like our sun and just like those incandescent light bulbs. The problem is that the idea is that this signal, which we can detect almost anywhere on Earth, actually, you can, uh, you can build a, an antenna yourself and measure the CMB. It's that, it's that strong of a signal, and it's that perfect of a black body spectrum. Now, the problem is, or let's say the interpretation is that this is a leftover hum from the beginning of the universe, right? And the moment in which this black body spectrum was generated was when the first plasmatic gaseous atoms appeared, right, during this recombination event when all of the subatomic material recombined and made atoms for the first time. There, these gaseous atoms released this radiation which was relayed around for gazillions of years until it gave us this perfect black body spectrum. So, if you cannot actually get a black body spectrum from a gaseous plasma, in other words, if the sun isn't actually a gaseous plasma, if it's perhaps has at least some component of condensed matter in it, some sort of lattice structure within it amongst the hydrogen, then 
one of the biggest pillars of the entire Big Bang Theory is, is completely thrown out the window, and we have to look for alternative explanations for that cosmic microwave background radiation. So we'll get more into all the details of that later. And, you know, you're welcome to make up your mind what you want about it all, honestly. I'm just trying to put on the table that there's some interesting, uh, you know, seismic activity in the field right now concerning these ideas that we've held for almost 100 years. Um, which could change quite a bit, and it could really rewrite our understanding of, of uh, cosmology as a whole. And in some sense, it's discomforting because, well, I think that having this conception of the universe having a beginning is, is in some sense very self-similar to our own lives, and I think that's why, in some sense, it's very appealing. You know, it's very difficult to think about anything that you, you do or any of the people that you love without thinking about a beginning and an end for their lives, right? And so it's natural that we would want to turn to the entire, this entire universe and think the same thing about it. I think the alternative uh, of a timeless universe is, is unsettling to some people. And it, of course, opens up a whole can of worms, like, you know, given an eternity of time, Will the universe run out of configurations and start repeating itself? You know, Nietzsche had this, uh, the, the German, famous German philosopher had this idea of the eternal recurrence. He was very much an, a believer that the, the universe was eternal. And, and he thought, well, at some point, the, the permutations will run out and the universe will just start over again. And essentially, everybody will have to relive their lives over and over again forever and ever. Because, you know, some, after, at some point, every single option will have run through. And um, I'm not sure I find that a particularly compelling argument, but maybe, yeah. What's the name of that Eternal recurrence. Yeah, check it out. There's a Wikipedia page about it. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. So, All right, so that's, that's why it matters. That's why we're going to spend some time picking this apart. You know, and another, another reason is because I don't think, you know, most science courses that you take, they're going to tell you what the state of the art is. I, that's, that is what the most popular theory is today. Um, and of course, your textbook does a great job of outlining that for you. And I'm going to try to, you know, do my best to make that clear to you. But what you don't often get is this, how much fierce debate led to the, the, the eventual assumption of these paradigms that we've inherited, right? And so, the, particularly the, the 18th and 19th centuries were just fiercely debating. These scientists were, were in no way agreeing with one another about any of these issues, and they were fighting and fighting and fighting. And it's really interesting how the ultimate conclusion that we, we end up with for most of the 20th century comes down to the fact that nobody had any idea what could be powering the sun, right? Every mechanism they could think of particularly the ones involving condensed matter, uh, they didn't pan out, right? Now, people didn't know about uh, exotic forms of matter back then. They didn't have advanced um, phase diagrams, right? They didn't know that, uh, they didn't even know the sun was made out of hydrogen until the very end, right? So they were, they were very limited in the evidence that they had to be able to interpret. And so when Edding, Arthur Eddington, who was kind of a combination of you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and pick your favorite scientist, very popular and, uh, you know, eloquent man. He came up with this fusion idea, essentially, all on his, all on his own. Uh, people said, well, that works. That'll do it. And Eddington developed the math necessary for the radiative transfer to get that black body spectrum out of it, which involves these photons bouncing around inside the sun for millions of years until they eventually come out at all the perfect frequencies to give us this nice spectrum. So <clears throat> one little, little mystery led to that, essentially. So we're, well, let's work our way towards it. <clears throat> OK. So the solar cycle that Mac brought up, this is, this is really interesting. So sunspots were some of the earliest, the earliest features that people were able to view on the sun. And they've been doing that for a really, really long time. And I'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, somewhere in the early 1800s, there was this German uh, pharmacist and an amateur astronomer. And I believe he was looking for an extra planet inside the orbit of Mercury. And he started to detail the 
uh, these patterns, he's kept really good notes of these spots that were appearing and disappearing. And he noticed that there was a rhythmicity to it, right? That they, they appear, there was more spots sometimes and less other times. Um, now, this turns out to be really important uh, because as we came to understand mechanistically what was going on, these spots... Uh, and we can look at them in different types of light. We can look at the way they, they're polarized light, and we get a picture of the magnetism, the magnetic fields, right, which is... Uh, so the magnetic fields that actually result in these, uh, these holes. So, like, one way to think about it is you have a hole. Well, let's look at it from the side. So if we're looking at the side of the sun, you have this hole in it, right? One way to think about it is there's actually... Uh, the surface is quite conductive and ionized, in some sense. Sorry, this isn't going to make it into my video. I'll have to do it over here. Uh, ah. um. So if we look at the side view of the sun, so what we see is like these, these holes in the surface, essentially, the surface. Um, and What's going on is there's actually uh, a very, it's very conductive here. It's very turbulent, and all of those, uh, all that conductivity leads to these loops of current, which eventually can give us these magnetic loops across it. Right. Now, to really understand that, and to understand why that teaches us anything about this cycling, we have to understand magnetism. At least we have to, at the very least, have a picture uh, of what magnetism might look like down on the actual material level, what the atoms are doing, right? So let's, let's turn our, our mind to that. This is, of course, the cycle, and we'll come back to it in a second. Okay, so the idea is that these coils are what are actually generating magnetism. Now, this is an easy, does anybody ever, uh, any, anybody played with electrical engineering or radio antennas or anything like that? One? Nice. And so you're probably well aware of this idea that coils are important in, in generating uh, radio signals and actually tuning into radio signals. And it has to do with this coil, the solenoid's ability to amplify um, and really um, yeah, amplify the magnetic effect of a wire. So what's kind of interesting is that individual wires actually uh, have a magnetic component to them, and it comes down to the atoms themselves. So let's assume we have an atom here. Now, what you'll find is that atoms themselves actually behave like tiny magnets. Now, what does that mean exactly? So you have an atom. It has actually a polar structure to it, just like the Earth. It has a North Pole. It has a South Pole to it, right? Actually, the South is going to be here. Let's do that. So the atoms actually have an electric field component to them, so they have an electric orientation. That just tells us where the poles are, essentially, right? Now, they also have a magnetic component, and the magnetic component wraps around their equators like this, okay? So what's interesting is that if you put a bunch of atoms end on end, like a little bead, uh, let's say, like... a. Uh, what would you say, a string of pearls like this, right? Well, so long as they're aligned, these are very simple atoms, by the way, this is like a hydrogen. So I've made a little wire, hypothetically, out of hydrogen atoms. They each are end on end, that is, their electric fields are all pointing in the same direction, and they're, equ they're equatorially aligned so that their uh, magnetic components are all in the, in the uh, same direction then this wire itself, this single atom wire, is also going to generate this, what we would say is an electric field, which surrounds it like this and rotates around it like this. Now, what does that actually mean? I think that um, there's a really interesting thing that happens in science, and particularly in physics, which is that, okay, we can calculate that atoms have this electric field. We can measure it with different, you know, voltmeters, ammeters, there's ways to actually measure the electric flow. We can see the direction of the electric field. We can also measure the magnetic effect, right? Because magnets, of course, displace one another depending on their orientation, and they attract one another and so forth. These are all measurable, tangible things, right? And we can develop incredible mathematics that can precisely predict, okay, if my current is this strong, how much magnet magnetism am I going to get out of it? 
The strange thing is that or mathematics like this can be very precise without us actually having any idea what the atoms are actually doing to, uh, to create these effects. And so one thing that I'm trying to develop here is, is a real material picture of what the atoms might be doing that's consistent with the mathematics. And one way that I've come to think about this, which I think is at the very least a useful way of visualizing what the surfaces of the atoms are doing, is that there's a particular motion of the outer surface of the atom. Now this surface, uh, the surface of the atom is called the electron, by the way, the electron shell, that's what the chemists call it. The outer surface, the electron, has some motion in it. It's called, it has an intrinsic mo motion to it. Um, we call this intrinsic motion spin, right? And what is spin? It's a particular kind of motion, and it's very bizarre, and it's, it's given people fits, and I think the reason that people haven't given an actual picture to what the surface of the atom is doing during this electric action is because spin is so bizarre. So electrons have a spin one half. What does this mean? It means that the thing, that any point on the surface has to rotate twice to get back to its starting point. Now, that's a really interesting puzzle, right? Like, what in the world could be happening for something to rotate twice? Why does it need to rotate twice to get back to its starting point? And so usually it's just taken as, okay, it's just this bizarre oddity of mathematics. Don't worry about what it actually means. I don't think that's a very useful approach. So I'll give you one possibility. This is a, maybe a, just a useful uh, heuristic for how to think about it because this is, this is a way that something could spin twice in, in order to get back to its starting point. One possibility is that the surface is actually folding in at the poles back into itself, almost vorticularly, right? So it's actually involuting through the poles. And it has, the surface has to involute twice before it makes a full equatorial rotation. So I think that's a, that's a material way of visualizing what the surface of the atom might be doing during this strange motion of a spin one half. But what falls out from it is that the equator is actually spinning, right? Now, there's another really interesting thing about electrons, too. Electrons actually, you know, we think about them as being these, mm, we think about the surface of the atom as being, like I, I drew here, a sphere, right? And that's, that's a reasonable approximation for what's going on. But there's a detail to it that doesn't get a lot of attention, which is that actually, if you measure the position of an electron, so this is like, let's say, you know, the probability of, uh, of finding an electron when you go looking for it. And on the bottom, on the x-axis on the, on the here, is going to be distance, okay? Well, when you're right at the nucleus, you never ever find an electron, right? And then you find, you almost always find the electron within some distance, I think around 200, 300 picometers. But what's really interesting is that there's a tiny chance that you'll find that electron forever, okay? So, what this says to, to me from a material interpretation is that the surface of the atom is actually a little bit fuzzy beyond its actual, so, so most of the surface is confined to a shell just like the sun, but there's some sort of tendrils that actually, that actually radiate out from the thing. That's one way of thinking about it. Now, if that's the case, as the equator processes during the spin one-half motion, in other words, during electricity, electric action, then there's some extended portion of that which is also rotating at the equator. That is what magnetism is. So those extended portions of the atom are able to interact with atoms next door. Maybe they're separated by some distance, but there's still a little bit of that electron shell that's reaching far enough to interact with its neighbors. So, back to our single atom wire. In our single atom wire here, completely hypothetical, no one's ever built a single atom wire, but it's the, it's the simplest way to think about things. All of the equators and all of that extended structure of the electron is all whipping around in the same direction. So, what happens if I bring another one of these wires next door? Well, if it's if that wire, I'm just going to draw the direction of the electric field here for you, just so we can stay oriented. And remember, the magnetic field follows. You can actually use your right hand to figure this out. So if you point the direction of the electric field, the magnet, magnetic field is going to curl around uh, in the direction of your fingers on your right hand. So if I put another wire next door to it that's doing the exact same thing, 
and this guy is also here. All of its magnetic action is going in the same direction. What's interesting is that these two, uh, these two motions combine. They're actually, they can synergize in some sense, since the magnetic action is actually all the same for both of these wires. And what happens is you get a tiny bit of attraction between these wires. We call that magnetic attraction. Now what happens is if I reverse this, and I have this, uh, this wire pointed the other direction, so that the current's flowing the other direction, I have the electric field going here, all of a sudden the magnetic action is contrasting to the wire beside it. It's actually batting up against it. Those, those, ex those uh, shells are actually in some sense pushing against one another. And the result, of course, is that these wires are pushed apart. This is the basis for magnetism. This is at least a, a, a visual basis for how you might understand how the heck it is that atoms are affecting each other uh, when they're you know, up next to each other in this, as they are in the sun or even at some slight distance from each other. Of course, magnetism falls off very steeply, much like the surface of the electron with respect to the atom. Now, what's really cool is if you take those wires and you curl them up, this gets us back to the solenoid. So let's take that same wire, single atom wire, and we curl it like this. We make a coil out of it, okay? We have all those little atoms, they're doing their thing, right? What's really interesting is these guys all have concerted direction of spin around the wire. And if you line it up, you're going to find that over and over again, they have that same spin, keeps being aligned like this. The result is there's a bigger, we could call it a magnetic field, but in reality, the surfaces of all those atoms are perfectly aligned equatorial. And what you have is this force from the surface of all these atoms that's pushing downward and through the poles of this solenoid, right? So you get this bigger magnet that's amplified and more powerful. Now, if you want to make a really strong electromagnet, what you can do is you take something like iron or nickel and you stick it in the center of this because iron and nickel have the ability to, to have their lattices, right? Their, their atoms can rearrange to fit the shape of whatever magnet is impressed upon them. So you, you've maybe magnetized something accidentally before, like a paperclip or something. That's because it, it's very impressionable in some sense. Those atoms can swivel in their position and their, their shells, the electric shells of those atoms can swivel in order to align themselves. And they'll get stuck that way. So you can amplify these. And this is very much what's happening under our own feet. And it's very much what's happening with the sun in terms of the production of the magnetic field. So let's see here. I, I guess I could have used those slides more, but I drew it out for you. So in the sun, we have these, this idea that there's similar solenoids going on. Now, what's organizing those solenoids, those, those coils uh, of electrically active atoms? The idea is that there's two processes. One is convection, right? So this idea that things which are less dense are going to rise to the surface as they heat, right? As, as, as atoms or, or whatever heats, they're going to take up more space rise to the top. As they cool, they're going to sink down to the bottom. So you get this, this sort of convection cycle going on. You also have this thing called a Coriolis force, which just means that as the sun is turning itself, it's kind of stirring things up. And the result of that is that you essentially built yourself a really nice electromagnet out of the sun. And because it's so strong, it's so big, it's so strong, Everything at the surface is highly magnetized and highly conductive, and things are just whipping around. And the result of that is that you get this very complicated magnetic structure of the sun. Now, there's a lot of mysteries about this that still remain. For instance, what is it that causes, why is it that the sun's magnetic field changes from, from decade to decade? So it turns out that the the orientation, right, the direction in which this solenoid is facing periodically inverts. And it inverts quite regularly and quite quickly. Now, the same thing happens on Earth. Our own magnetic field also inverts periodically, but it seems like it takes on the order of almost a million years for that to happen. On the Sun, it's on the order of decade, on, on the order of a decade, right? And what's really interesting is that the, as the Sun's polarity changes throughout the cycle, these sunspots become more and less apparent. And actually the polarity of the sunspots, so 
I drew a picture for you of the loops on the surface of the sun. Uh, and we could say that these, uh, these loops have a, a sort of directionality to them. And they're going to scatter light differently depending on their, their polarization. The direction of that changes also every, every cycle. And so you have a readout of when you, know, you can see the direction that the light is being scattered from these loops. You can see that the polarity of the actual sunspots essentially is changing from time to time as well. So this is really interesting because in some sense we have an idea that this is a regular phenomenon. You can see it very carefully. People have been watching these sunspots over the years. They change uh, quite predictably. And yet the mechanism by which those instabilities build up and it switches and inverts is very, very, very poorly understood. So that's a really cool open, open topic for, for folks. Now in terms of how it affects us here on Earth, this is perhaps even, even more poorly understood. But there does seem to be at least some correlation between the weather, so the temperature, which I think is written here in, in, in yeah, I think the temperature actually, the average temperature is in black here. This is in Europe. Um, and it, and there's, there's some speculation. There was a very cold period in Europe in the 1600s, um, which is called the Maunder Minimum. And it corresponded to a dearth of sunspots at the same time. And so there's like, there's some interesting correlations there, but the, the way in which that might be playing out is, is somewhat lost on people. Um, no one's, in other words, no one's actually come up with a satisfactory model that can explain exactly how that's happening. So sometimes you get correlations in science that are just, you know, have nothing to do with the causation. I think a good example is ambulances and car crashes, right? I don't know if you've heard this one, but it's like, hey, if an alien came to the planet and they were sampling time on the order of hours with their instruments, and they saw that every time you have a car crash, there's an ambulance there, they might think that the ambulances cause the car crashes, right? You need like a really, really fine degree of resolution and being able to track the ambulances and track the car crashes before you're actually going to see that the car crash precedes the ambulance arriving. So it's very difficult to separate out correlations sometimes. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting scientist, uh, this lady, Valentina Zharkova, who is an astrophysics, uh, astrophysicist at Northumbria University in the UK. I had a conversation with her recently. Uh, she published a paper back in Nature in 2016, which she supposed that actually the other bodies in the solar system, like Jupiter in particular, the really big ones, they kind of tug on the sun a little bit, right? And this makes sense. Actually, the the center of gravity between Jupiter and the Sun is actually somewhat outside of the Sun. So Jupiter doesn't exactly orbit the Sun, it orbits a point right outside of the Sun. And they, the Jupiter and the Sun sort of co-orbit that, because Jupiter is so enormous. And her idea was, was something like, as this, uh, this actual central point where all the planets are congregating around, as it moves, that it's going to actually put forces onto the sun, which are going to reorganize it in different ways. They're going to change its ability, uh, the pressure on the sun, its ability to radiate. It's going to lower the irradiation, the irradiance that we receive here on Earth. And actually that the Earth's distance as well is going to change with respect to the sun. Now she got in a lot of trouble for this paper, which is interesting because she didn't actually publish the uh, astronomical records that showed that the positions of the planets were indeed changing over time. And so they actually ended up retracting this paper, um, which she became very irate about. She actually ended up publishing a subsequent paper where she did publish the ephemera and all of the astronometric data and showed that the planets actually were changing positions. So jury is still out on that. It's a very interesting uh, theory, but nobody really knows is the truth. Um, there's also the possibility that um, these little ice ages or even, the re even some of this uh, correlation between the sun and the earth could have to do with volcanism, right? So there was, uh, let's see, you know, every time that you have a volcanic eruption, you really disturb the amount of ultraviolet radiation that gets absorbed in the upper atmosphere. So these little particles like sulfur dioxide and so forth, uh, even water from most, by the way, most volcanoes, uh, uh, m most of the emissions from volcanoes are water. I don't know if you guys realize that. 
and it's a huge uh, contributor to greenhouse gas and so forth as well. So you could actually imagine a situation where if the sun is in some sense uh, altering the, 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 if its output is changing based on this uh, ability to constrain more or less its, its uh, radiative effects through these sunspots, because I guess this is something I didn't mention yet, but when those sunspots are, uh, when there's more sunspots, what's the effect? Well, it means that, first of all, more radiation streams out from the interior of these holes. But second of all, these, these loops uh, of uh, material that are, that are magnetically organized across the sunspots, they break periodically. And sometimes when they break, they fling this really hot ionized stuff at the Earth, right? Which, of course, impacts us and, and uh, impacts our own magnetic field, changes the shape of it. Um, actually can be quite disastrous, right? We can get some serious, uh, sometimes these, they call them solar storms, right? And, and it's no joke, the last huge solar storm took out the telegraph system worldwide. And we haven't really had one that's been significant, a direct hit like that since then, but I don't think we've ever depended on telecommunications more, uh, well, I don't think that's speculation. We've never depended on telecommunications more than we are, do in our present civilization. So it's a serious uh, issue. Um, and so the idea is that perhaps the stability, the tectonics even could be influenced by this. Certainly weather can be influenced by it. And so as a result, you could perhaps get periods of cooling and warming on the Earth as, as the result of this. Now climate's a real mess to try to understand. There's so many factors that go into, into climate. Yeah? They're, they're cooler, actually. Yeah, the dark spot is cooler, the outside is, is warmer. Um, but the, the, the key part is that they actually open up a, a barrier for um, radiation and solar wind to be extruded from the holes in a way that's usually sort of held back by the magnetic network, let's say, this uh, almost, um, yeah, I think a net's a good way to think about it, tangles of magnetism on the surface that would otherwise trap particles and keep them sort of churning there in perpetuity, in the, let's say, minimums, the solar minimums, right, where we don't have sunspots. So it's, it's, a, it's a more active period as far as we're concerned here on Earth. So let's see where we're at here. All right, so um, I think we're going to keep coming back to space weather. It's a really interesting thing, but it's also one of those places that is completely up for grabs right now. It's very poorly understood. Um, the last time I talked to anybody at NASA about this, they were planning a bunch of, well, let's say granting uh, subsections that were going to start looking at problems, particularly regarding seismicity, which I think is quite interesting. You know, a huge, it would be a huge advantage if we could predict earthquakes, right? You know, I, I spent a lot of time living down in the Bay Area in California, and it's like, you never really stop thinking about it. It's like, when's, you know. And I think in, in the best case scenario right now, they'll be able to, they'll be able to give a warning, uh, maybe a minute or two in the best case scenario, uh, when these earthquakes are going to happen. And they're really disastrous. The tsunamis are often even more disastrous. Um, so if there is some sort of interaction between the sun and seismicity on Earth or volcanism, that would be really interesting because the solar activity is actually quite predictable. And if you watch the sun, you can get information uh, quite a ways ahead of when it actually is going to be influencing us here on Earth. So promising, but, you know, poorly, poorly understood at this point in time. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn our, our, our minds towards the history of, of, of the sun a little bit, or the history of observing the sun. Um, I do want to at least... You know, I'm actually trying to play catch up a little bit because we lost the class and we're not going to get it back. So I'm going to have to maybe trim down some of this a little bit. But I do think that it's worth considering uh, the birth of astronomy for just a moment in terms of the sun because the sun was central to almost every historic culture that we were aware of. You know, why did astronomy as a discipline even arise? In some sense, it seems to have arisen because people became obsessed with making predictions. And the sun was a very predictable 
occurrence, right? The rise of the sun every day, the set of the sun, the year, where the sun's going to be at a very given position in the year. Now, if you can, you know, if you're, if you're the organizer of a very primitive society, I don't like the word primitive, uh, an early society, right? Well, if you, uh, if you have a way of knowing when, uh, let's say, when the winter, how close it is to the winter, right? How close is it do we need to wrap up our harvest for the year? How, how soon do we need to finish our hunting and get it packed away, right? Or, or salted or put in the snow? How, how can you imagine the future is going to go? And if you can tell that story in a very captivating and robust way, you probably have a lot of social capital in that society, right? So in some sense, a lot of the mythology and religions that grew up in these, civil, these early, I don't even want to say civilizations, but cultures, indigenous communities, societies, they very much were concerned with the rhythms of life and the regularity and the predictability of it. Because in some sense, like, that's the fundamental human project, is to be able to make predictions about how things are going to go. That's what we all do all day, every day, right? You go into any situation, and what are you doing as you go into it, right? You're trying to imagine how the best case this uh, interaction could go. Let's say it's a job interview or, or a test that you're taking for a class or something, right? You want to prepare yourself for the future based on the inevitable outcomes that you might encounter in that situation. And I think that's what a lot of these ancient mythologies and religions were built up upon. So it seems like people have been, been trying to make sense and study the sun for almost, well, for as long as we, we can see. And of course, the written record is, is far shorter than this, the, the oral traditions. And, and even the oral traditions of indigenous cultures, they tell this same idea that, that people were very much looking at the sun as this predictable, uh, you know, in some sense, a deity. But what does that really mean? It's, it's really just this lamppost for, for how we can mark our own lives with the rhythm of nature in a way that's predictable and useful. All right, so I want to read you a little, uh, little section because I'm probably not capable of telling this story as well as somebody who's actually from one of these indigenous communities. Let's see here, page 221. Um, this is actually a pretty cool book. I, I read it a little bit last semester if you guys were here. This is called Native Science. Uh, highly recommend. It's by Gregory Cajete. Um, and most of the stories here are from the Navajo tradition. I unfortunately couldn't find much from our, our own people, uh, the, the, the native people, to these parts. Um, but, so this will have to suffice. But it's kind of interesting. So I want to read you a little piece on the sun. Um, it goes like this. <clears throat> the Holy Ones realized that the universe needed light. They also realized that there was no order, direction, or sense of time or measurements without it. The Holy Ones again collaborated to address these needs. First man and first woman brought the energy of the sun, moon, and a crystal star from the first world. In the second world, coyote, first boy, and first girl were created, and together they brought the knowledge of heat and light from the clear crystal to the fourth world, which is our world on earth, all of which was eventually used to produce the sun. The Holy Ones decided that the sun, considered to have male characteristics, would provide order to the days and seasons. The seasons are recognized by the location of sunrise, of course. Referred to as the day traveler, the sun is used to determine time in the general sense as well as to determine the cardinal directions. The equinoxes and solstices are considered sacred times of the year, the end of the sun's journey marking the passage of time and seasons. Blessing way ceremonies are held to ensure that the actions of the people and the earth are in harmony. At these times, it is said that for thousands of years, the sun, moon, planets, air, water, and electrical forces have aligned themselves at these times, a universal alignment where energy is shared. So I think we get this real sense that, that people care about the sun because it gives us something to stand on. It's predictable. It's regular. You know, this will keep coming up, but if you, if you don't have a rhythm to your life, it can become, you know, it can become very psychologically disturbing, right? I think that it's a huge, 
issue, actually, especially when you're young. A lot of you guys are coming out of uh, living at home for the first time, and, and you have to set up those rhythms for yourself. And the result of not doing that is something like anxiety, right? That's the feeling that you get when you don't have something uh, that's kind of your compass for what you're going to be doing at any given moment, right? If everything's kind of up in the air for you. And I think these indigenous people recognize that very strongly. And that's what they're pointing to when they're actually watching the sun and, and monitoring it. Now, some of the first people to actually keep really good records of it were the Sumerians and the Babylonian, uh, who, who came a bit later. Um, particularly the Babylonians are where we have the, the best records of. Now, the Babylonians were interesting. They actually had this... Uh, they had a class of people whose job it was to keep track of the stars and, and the sun and, and the astronomical uh, bodies as they moved through the sky. So these people were called the Chaldeans. And um, it's really interesting. So the Chaldeans lived on like one side of Babylon. They had like a district almost that these people lived in. They were an ethnically distinct class of people. They don't seem to have been particularly revered though, although they weren't exactly slaves, but they, they certainly... Um, well, you might think of them as something like academics, right? Making like, you know, low five-figure salaries, like sort of getting by. Um, but they seem to have been tasked with keeping track of the skies, right? And so um, what's really interesting is, is these people have started to get really good at keeping track and predicting things like eclipses. Now, imagine the amount of power that you would have uh, with respect to your constituency as a politician back in the Sumerian times, if you could say, hey, I was talking with God yesterday, and he told me that the sun's going to disappear for a few minutes on Friday. And then it did, right? I mean, I think it's, it's hard for us to imagine with our like, highly technological civilization, and everybody is essentially uh, educated with some degree uh, of rationality and you know, with some basic belief that occurrences should have mechanism that underpin them. But I don't think that was the case at this point in time. And so, you know, being able to divine the motions of the sky in advance, I think, was a really, really powerful organizing principle for these people. And that can't be understated. And we see that, of course, in Mesoamerica, too. It seems to have been a very, very strong organizing principle for the authoritarian state at the time. Um, in fact, bestowing them with the, the literal authority of th that, that the people gave them. So, um, what can we say about that? Really, the first, it's very difficult. I, when I, I, I try to avoid things like saying the first person to actually materially describe the sun was this person. The truth is that most of the information that we have access to here in the West is from Western sources, right? It's very clear to us that People in the ancient Indus civilization, people in ancient China were also thinking about the sun in these same time periods as the Greeks that I'm about to talk about in a moment. But we don't have, there's a huge language barrier there. There's literally a divide, like a wall between our academies and the academies in the East. It's very difficult for us to share information. And so I have a hell of a time finding anything out about the real, like finding original source material from those, those ancient Eastern civilizations. Um, there is some sense that they were studying the same things, but I just can't speak to it as clearly. So <clears throat> in the West, one of the, the first peoples to really start to think about these orbs in the sky as anything other than deities uh, was the Greeks. So even when the Sumerians were predicting those eclipses and tracking the possession of the planets and the stars, they were treating them as if they were entities, right? They weren't material bodies in the sky. And so one of the first uh, Greeks to really think about this was the philosopher Anaxagoras. And, you know, the, there's an apocryphal story that he saw a meteor come and hit the ground. Yeah. How do you spell that? Anaxagoras? Yes. A-N-A-X-A-G-O-R-A-S. Oh, no. A-N-A-X-A-G-O-R-A-S. Yeah, and so I think this, there's an apocryphal story that perhaps he saw a meteor come burning through the sky one day, and he actually tracked it down, and he went and found that it was warm still. He actually found the meteorite on the ground, which is the burnt-up meteor. And he, he thought, wow, I think that's what the sun is, actually. I think that it's a burning ball of metal, something like this. Um, and so 
That was, uh, actually don't have a date for that, but I'm guessing that was probably around 500 BC. So <clears throat> it's really interesting because the Greeks were, were very rational people. They were, and by the way, the Greeks weren't like a country, you know. It's actually in some sense, uh, some sense equivalent to the United States. It was really a group of islands and a bunch of different people. And each island would have like a university, essentially call it an academy. Uh, they would have different cultures and cuisines and music. It was a very rich and diverse community of interrelated peoples. Um, and they really had a serious enlightenment going on back then. You know, um, this other philosopher named Arist Aristothenes, it's a hard one to say, these guys had crazy names. Aristothenes actually calculated the distance to the sun using some basic uh, geometry. He calculated the radius of the earth and he was more or less accurate with it. We talked a bit last semester about how he did that. Um, but what's really sad is that after the Greeks, for like a thousand years in the West, um, all of these ideas were abandoned and we went back to this very uh, metaphysical approach to nature. Uh, and, and people kind of gave up on, on the idea that these things were intelligible and instead that that wasn't a really worthy pursuit. Um, now, fortunately, uh, it was not the case everywhere. So the rise of Islam in the 700s, there was a great deal of mathematics and scholarship that came out of that, where they were kind of resurrecting a lot of these ideas of the Greeks long before the Enlightenment period, um, which is essentially where we have to jump to next because that's unfortunately where history picks up again. Now, I think it's like, in some sense, it's not insignificant that, that these dark ages happen, and I think, they can, I think that we should be careful to think that we're immune to them. Um, and this is why, in some sense, I'm so obsessed with uh, the progress of science, right? Because what can happen is that if people get locked into some way of thinking because it's productive for their means, just like the eclipse predictors from the Sumerians, right? I mean, they weren't really interested in understanding what was going on in the sky. They were interested in divining how it would unfold in the future. Now, a mathematical ob obsession with physics is not so different than that, actually, because mathematics is fantastic for telling you how a system works in terms of its parameters. But mathematics can never explain anything. Well, that's a pretty radical statement that I'm making there, but think about it for a second. What does mathematics do? It, it gives you the description of a pattern of a system, right? But it doesn't actually paint you a picture of what the material actors are doing inside of that system. So I could make a fantastic mathematical model for you of how, let's say, the stars are rotating all around the Earth, right? I could, draw, I could actually model that for you. And in fact, people did that all throughout the Dark Ages. Um, they firmly believed that everything rotated around the Earth. It was a very mathematically consistent picture but it lacked some rational considerations, right? For instance, why the Earth, right? What about the fact that there's phases on these other planets like Venus, right? Why, why, do, why does the moon have phases? Doesn't it seem like some of these other planets might be rotating as well? But these considerations didn't feed into the mathematics and so people went with them for a very long time. And often in science, when we get too obsessed inside of the mathematical formulations that we come up with, we run the risk of actually derailing ourselves into these kind of intellectual dark ages. So we're not immune to that. That can happen again, and we have to be careful. All right. Now, let's see. Sunspot, sunspots, let's keep going with this. Um, the really, you know, like I said, there was, there's some evidence that sunspots were being observed throughout the Dark Ages. There was some evidence for that being done in the Han Dynasty in China. Also, like I said, in Islam, uh, early Islam, the Persians and so forth. Um, <clears throat> it really, really didn't pick up until Galileo invented, well, Galileo adopted the telescope. He actually invented the idea that you could turn the telescope towards the sky. So that was a somewhat revolutionary idea. And... <clears throat> What did he see? Um, he saw these sunspots, and, and what did they look like to them? They looked like clouds, actually. And this was the first time that anything approximating uh, material features of the sun were being thought about for the first time. This opened a whole can of worms. Wow, the sun has clouds. Does it have an atmosphere? Does it have, you know, mountains? Does it have people living on it? What's going on, right? Actually, 
The idea that there was people living on the sun was entertained until about 150 years ago. That's really shocking probably to most of you. But you know, when people started to see these holes, these dark holes, well, after, let's, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but you know, very quickly people g got rid of the idea that they were clouds. Um, they started thinking of them as holes, and they thought, well, maybe it's just hot on the surface, and beneath it, there's a nice, cool region where it's very temperate, you know, and people, the Solarians, could be living inside of there quite comfortably, because it's only hot on the surface. That wasn't that long ago that people were thinking like that. Okay, so last 15 minutes, I'm gonna, uh, I want to tear into that, that really important century. Um, this is a really, really, really good paper that one of my friends wrote. Uh, that goes into much more depth than I'm going to probably be able to get into. Um, Pierre's an, a really, really interesting dude. He was actually, uh, he invented uh, the modern version of the MRI machine, actually. Um, before Pierre worked on it, somebody had invented the concept of MRI, but it was really grainy. You couldn't actually resolve things like blood vessels. You couldn't actually really see anatomical features. And so, he uh, got this group together at Ohio State and built this really, really powerful MRI machine um, that is essentially the basis of the ones that we use for everything from CAT scans and, and so forth today in the medical industry. Really brilliant dude. Um, and, you know, after he got done with this big technological adventure, you know, he kind of reached the, the height of his career as the director of the radiology department there at Ohio State. Um, he started realizing that a lot of his knowledge, he had his background training was in biochemistry and spectroscopy, right? So interpreting light, essentially. Particularly when you excite, the way an MRI machine works is you essentially excite atoms and you see how those electromagnetic waves result from their relaxation. So you're interpreting spectra just like we do when we look at the stars and the sun. And he started thinking, uh, he started diving deep into the history and thinking about the sun and thinking about the solar spectra a lot. And um, he's made the back half of his career from kind of uh, understanding how all of this happened. So I'm going to be drawing on, on his paper here, which is really, really good. Uh, what's really funny is that we see an interesting circle here. So like I said, the original Greeks, uh, the first announcement we have of anything other than the sun being a god is that it's a burning ball of metal, right? <clears throat> Now what we're going to see is that people tried on every other conceivable idea of, during these few centuries after the Enlightenment. And now we find ourselves at a really interesting crossroad where, again, we, we are struggling to explain to ourselves how in the world the sun could be anything other than condensed matter because we can't actually seem to get a gaseous plasma to produce a spectrum anything like the one that we see from the sun. Again, that spectrum that we see from the sun is, a, is an almost perfect black body. It's one of the most perfect, other than the CMB, it's one of the most perfect black bodies in the world that we can see. And of course, we can heat up things and we'll see that same spectrum here on Earth. But we just can't do it with a gas. So it's, there seems to be a circle of history that's gone on here. And so I'm going to try to walk you through that arc a little bit. And I've got some quotes here that I think are quite interesting. So, <clears throat> one of the first people uh, to really get involved, this was during Enlightenment, the Enlightenment Europe. Now it's, by the way, after Galileo and the telescope came online, I, I would say Galileo is probably the first scientist as we think about it. The first person who was like, hey, look, enough of this like mysticism from the Dark Ages. We need to have rational explanations for how things happen. And so he really invented the idea of doing experiments for the first time. Um, <clears throat> you know, he, he famously was able to essentially understand how bodies were operating under gravity, um, all sorts of uh, dynamical experiments regarding motion of bodies, what keeps bodies in motion, uh, really everything that Newton built into the famous theories that we use today uh, was started by Galileo. So Galileo kicked off this revolution in science. People everywhere, especially the aristocracy, it's not like it was a job. You couldn't just be like, I'm going to be a scientist when I grow up. That wasn't a thing for many, many years. That actually wasn't a thing until about the 1950s. For most of this Enlightenment period, it was people who were already wealthy, successful, you know, barons or they were politicians or doctors or lawyers or something else, and they just did science because it was cool. It was like a very uh, society thing to be a part of. Okay, so one of the first people to really write about the sun and its material composition was this guy named Joseph Lalande. He was in France. Um, 
he has this to say, he was, in, in, in reading, uh, he was very much an acolyte of Galileo. He said of Galileo, Galileo, who was in no manner attached to the system of incorruptibility of the heavens, thought that the sunspots were a type of smoke, clouds, or sea foam that forms on the surface of the sun, on which swim an ocean of subtle and fluid material. In 1612, Galileo wrote, I am led to this belief primarily by the certainty I have that the ambient is very tenuous, fluid, yielding substance, from seeing how easily the spots contained in it change shape and come together and divide, which would not happen in a solid or firm material. Okay, so he's noticing that the surface changes quite a bit, right? And this is the first hint that it can't just be a ball of metal like the original Greek philosopher had written. It didn't make sense because we don't see metals, you know, moving around on Earth. Um, volcanoes, perhaps, but we'll get to that in a second. Or, or magma. All right. Now, one thing that's really interesting is Galileo set a really cool precedent. Um, I'll read this for you. Galileo wrote... For I am very sure that the substance of the spots could be a thousand things unknown and unimaginable to us, and that the accidents we observed in them, in their shape, opacity, motion, being very common, can provide us with either no knowledge at all, or little but the most general sort. Therefore, I do not believe that the philosopher who was to acknowledge that he does not and cannot know the composition of sunspots would be deserved any blame whatsoever. So he's like, look, we're going to do our best to make sense of this, but whatever we come up with is probably wrong. That's a really profound thing to, to put forward when you are essentially the first scientist ever in the modern sense, and you're like one of the most famous dudes on the planet at the time, right? That's a really, really uh, beautiful expression of humility. It's like, hey, look, this thing that we're doing, trying to understand the natural world mechanistically, it doesn't necessarily have an endpoint to it, right? The more we learn, the more we're going to have to rethink our original assumptions. And so I think this is a really, really good, uh, you know, lighthouse for how, how things need to be going with us as we approach science in the future. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry to, to hit you with this table, but I just wanted to show you there's a lot of people who worked on this since. So Thales is, is back in the early days. Uh, he's also uh, one of these, people, these Greeks who, who no, thought about the sun as some sort of metal solid, based on the meteorite analogy. Galileo, Descartes appears. Really, the, the next serious thinker about this was William Herschel, who was an astronomer in 1774. Uh, he wrote this. It has been supposed that a fiery liquid surrounded the sun and that it's, by its ebbing and flowing, the highest parts of it were occasionally uncovered and appeared under the shape of dark spots and in that manner successively assumed different phases. So he's thinking about the surface as flowing in some sense, and the, the holes, this is the first time we get the idea that instead of clouds, we have holes in that fluid surface of the sun. Now, what was also really fascinating is that Herschel thought that the fluid itself was some sort of an elastic substance, and that because of its frictions, right? As this flowing was going on, that flowing was actually leading to some sort of uh, electrical, uh, like almost in the sense of static electricity, but an electrical process that the sun would be electrically active and therefore we would get all of the irradiance out of it. Now, this is not so far from the way that we think about it today, so it, it's actually quite prescient. Um, Herschel also, uh, described the star as inhabited back in 1795. So he was the one who really first thought of the idea that, hey, if there's these cooler regions beneath this uh, luminous fluid at the surface, then, hey, why couldn't folks live there? You know, it's really interesting looking at the history of astronomy, how much people were not even skeptical of the idea that there should be people living on all of these planets. You know, all the way up until the 1970s, it was a fairly seriously entertained idea that there should be people living on Mars, or at least something alive, right? Until we got there, uh, until we literally went to Mars and saw that it was a, a barren hellscape, people believed that there would be life found there. Because when you look at Mars from here, you actually see that it changes with the seasons. It gets dark. You know, the way that the, the atmosphere refracts light, it almost looks like it greens a little bit in one of the seasons. So there's, there's ample reason, and people just kind of took this as a foregone conclusion. Of course, there's people everywhere. Why shouldn't there be? 
Um, I think it's been really tragic, actually, during the history of space exploration to find that there aren't people everywhere. All right, where else do we want to go from this? All right, so fluid, the fluid sun was proposed next. <clears throat> All right, so the next guy, uh, so this is a gentleman named Arago uh, who was writing about, uh, he did a lot of work with the wave nature of light. He was on the, the forefront of that idea. He writes, many conjectures have been offered in explanation for these spots. Some have supposed that the sun, from which so vast a quantity of light and heat is incessantly emanating, is a body in a state of combustion, and that these dark spots are nothing other than scoriae, which is the slag that comes off of molten metal, floating on its surface. The faculae, on the contrary, those are the spots, they're supposed due to volcanic eruptions from the liquefied mass. The grand objection to this hypothesis is that it does not suffice to explain the phenomenon. It has not obtained uh, admission by astronomers. The opinion most in favor in the present day regards the sun as consisting of an obscure and solid nucleus enveloped by two atmospheres, one obscure, the other luminous. In this case, the appearance of the spot is explained by the ruptures occurring in the atmosphere and exposing the globe of the sun to view. Uh, another gentleman came along. Uh, this guy was actually a father. He was in the Catholic Church. <clears throat> um, and actually, Herschel, William Herschel's son, John Herschel, picked up where he left off. And he writes, while it agrees with that of an aggregation of luminous matter in the masses of some considerable size and some degree of consistency, suspended or floating at a level determined by their gravity in non-luminous fluid, be it gas, vapor, liquid, or that intermediate or transi gradual transition from liquid to vapor, which the experiments of Gennard de la Tour have placed visibly before us. So this is right when people first discovered this fourth state of matter that they call, started calling plasma. I think this is really the introduction of the modern concept of the sun. <clears throat> well, we don't really know. We don't have a liquid that would satisfy these conditions, particularly with respect to the density uh, and luminosity. And, you know, it does seem to be fluid flowing. It has some flow to it, fluid dynamics to it. Um, and it seems to be magnetizable, right? There's electric activity in some sense that might be organizing some of these features. And so plasma was the nat natural outcome of that. Um, all right, look, we're, uh, we're at the point where we need to start talking again about black bodies and Kirchhoff, uh, because Kirchhoff appears in 1962, and Kirchhoff actually comes out and, and joins into the scientific debate about the material composition of the sun. And initially, Kirchhoff uh, writes that the sun consists of a solid or liquid nucleus heated to a temperature of the brightest whiteness surrounded by an atmosphere of somewhat lower temperature. So Kirchhoff has this very uh, condensed matter vision of the sun, but he changes his mind later. And he changes his mind because he really wants his studies on black body radiation to be able to be extended to all types of matter. There was this holy grail in science and physics at the time that if, it's cool to make a theory, but it's even cooler to universalize it. And so let's pick up here next time and we're very, very close to, to getting up to the present day where we will understand why it is that we believe the sun is a plasma and why we believe that that's the road towards fusion. Otherwise, have a good week, guys. I will see you Thursday. Oh, one more thing. Anybody wants to come early, I'll make a pot of coffee before class so we can hang out. I would love to meet some of you guys. I'm going to try to do that on Thursdays in so much as people come. I'll send an email, though. <laughs>